to Preparing for the Unexpected with Alex Fullick. People, organizations, and communities need to prepare for and respond to natural and man-made disasters in a timely manner and in the most effective way possible. Our program examines what is being done before, during, and after a disaster and those unexpected events to keep you in the know. Disasters can happen to anyone. The question is, when will it happen to you? Now, here is your host, business continuity and disaster planning expert, Alex Bullock. Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to resilience, business continuity, disaster planning, crisis management, anything that's relatable to those topics, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community plan for, prepare, respond, and overcome adverse situations. If there is a topic you'd like us to talk about on the show, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free, come to my LinkedIn page or leave a comment uh, on uh, um, YouTube, or there's a button underneath the graphic on the uh, Voice America show. Uh, I get all emails, all comments. I am the only Alex Fullick on LinkedIn, so I'm really easy to find. Let me know, and we'll see about getting you on the show or finding someone to talk about the topic that you'd like us to uh, touch on. Long-time listeners, especially on Voice America, you'll know that I presented at the BCI Virtual World Conference in November 2020, and I had said for quite some time it was my hope that I could get a couple of other speakers to come and talk on the show. Today is one of those days. I'm lucky enough to have with me uh, Dr. Jackie Taylor and her topic that she presented at the conference on smart cities. Dr. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Delighted to be here. Now, uh, I've got listeners and viewers literally around the globe. Could you take a minute or two and tell us about yourself? Yes, so um, my background is I'm an aerospace engineer. And um, in uh, 2009, I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Tim Berners-Lee, who founded the World Wide Web, to hear about how there was a next evolution required. He co-opted all of us that met that day on the 12th of March, 2009, the uh, 20th anniversary of the World Wide Web, to actually build out the next uh, phase. Um, I signed up for that challenge and founded my company, Flying Binary. And what we've done since that day is build uh, deep technology. And deep technology is a combination of engineering discipline, my background, my co-founder is also an engineer, and, and science, but the science part of our deep tech, we invented. So um, we effectively uh, took the challenge from Sir Tim Berners-Lee and created what we call web science approaches. And that science that we founded has delivered, um, uh, has delivered change, positive change to over half of the world's population that was recognized with an award um, just after the BCI conference in November. Oh, well, congratulations on your award. Thank you. Now, uh, I mentioned your topic, Smart Cities. I'm interested in this topic because, uh, as I mentioned to you before we actually started uh, recording, uh, I sit on the advisory board of directors for the International Emergency Management Society, TEAMS, and Mm -hmm. I have read some papers and seen some presentations on smart cities, and I find the topic really interesting. But can you describe for people, because it is still a new topic and overall not a lot of people know what it is. So can you describe what smart cities really means and what it is? Yeah, so I'm going to don, for the rest of this interview, I'm going to don my smart cities are hat and the first smart cities are across the world. And that um, is because in 2018, we had um, an issue across smart cities across most of the world. So it's something that founded, I was part of the UK's cabinet office team that did the UK intervention. We wrote the first standards and got the market enablement movement movement going. But by 2018, we were not in a good place. And essentially, uh, what happened was I, I ended up doing a series of interventions across the world, understanding where we were at. And, and at that point in time, smart cities were not smart. And, and did that matter? It did matter because in industrial internet things, which the deep tech that we build is for, the future hubs of business are smart cities. 55% of, t- of today's uh, world population live in them. So it's a today thing. It's already there. And that's expected to rise. 
uh, to 68% by 2050. And I'm an expert advisor at the UN curating that 2050 plan and the, and the move towards smart cities. But what are they? Now, um, you know, I've written five standards on smart cities that internationally are used um, to, to make the change happen. But, and so there's an official definition, but I don't use that one. Because to me, they're urban, they're rural, they're coastal. We think of the big urban sprawl, but they're not just that. They're where technology enables better health and well-being outcomes. But the key thing they are is it they're inclusive. It includes all citizens, all visitors. And essentially, it's not a city initiative. It's about communities. And what they do in the reset agenda from 2018 is deliver an inclusion agenda. And what that means is leaving no one behind. Um, they're complex. They're messy. But there's one thing every smart city in the world has. And I, as a, uh, an advisor to the Beijing government on their 650 smart cities, true for China too, because people often say, what about China? Every single city across the world is actually different. It doesn't matter whether they're co-located, you know, within 50 kilometers of one another, they're all different. And so now we're starting not to, across the world, use the tag smart cities. But like you say, it's quite new. So that I think that as a as a tag as a label is going to uh, pervade, and obviously as part of our talk, we can explore what might happen next and what the issues are, etc. But in essence, that's what I believe they are. How do I know if I'm in a smart city? Like, what are the factors that if I, I, I either I'm living in a city or I'm a tourist to a city, how can I recognize? You know, what factors make up a smart city? So everybody who immediately talks about the tech, um, I mean, I'm a technologist, so, but, but tech for me should disappear. Tech is actually not the outcome. So you shouldn't be in a city and think, oh, I'm in a smart city because I see lots of tech. Um, mm. Actually, you're not in a smart city if that's your response. But if what you have is an experience where, as I say, the, the key is to enable better well-being and health outcomes, if what you don't see is the tech, but you actually see the tech enabling that to happen, then you're in a smart city. So if actually as a visitor to a city and a citizen of that city, your experience is the same, that's a start point. But it's actually around uh, the participation with you in, in your interface, your interaction with that city. The tech should fade. The tech should be not in your way. Certainly should be frictionless. It shouldn't be something that, that knows about you or needs to in any way curate you, but it should be something that enables you to do what you do. And so those services that all of our um, cities provide should be for the citizens' benefit, and you should be able to tell that by the fact that they sort of disappear on you and you can get to do what you need to do. Um, and that's really the, the essence of the change that took place from 2018, because that's not where we were. We were in the place where the tech was everywhere but the purpose had got lost. Yeah, I've, I've sat through presentations before and they've talked about making sure the traffic lights are, you know, coordinated and things like that. Yeah. But uh, I, you just said, you know, it's not tech. So what other kinds of things are there involved with a smart city? So at the end of the day, um, what we're attempting to do is actually have great services uh, for our citizens we all pay our taxes we all you know are creating businesses in there we need to support communities there's a there's a whole host of needs in a, in a community and, a, and often a city is made up of a series of communities um, and so it's all about serving that population the best so for example I, if I give you an example of somewhere like Barcelona in Spain that will look to serve a large tourist population, obviously look after its own citizens, but it's a very high footfall city. If I was to say somewhere like um, Bristol, which is in the south of uh, the UK, which is also a, a, you know, a, a, a tourist destination, actually it's very concerned about its green credentials. So often what a city has first is, what theme is my priority? Because, you know, funding is not infinite. We have to choose priorities. 
there's an, a civic responsibility to citizens, but there's an elected responsibility. Sometimes there's a tension between that electoral uh, responsibilities, which are short term, and the civic ones, which are long term. So there's a tension there. But usually what cities, what I help people do first, um, if I'm working across a government, I, I often I'm brought in to do the strategic plan for either a nation or in the last case, the G20 or, or the UN. What I, I actually try to get everybody to do is say, all cities are different. So how do we choose priorities? And, and this is about negotiating them. That's not about, you know, a local or a national level laying down some sort of homogenous offering. It's not that. It's actually understanding what the options are and selecting priorities. And if you do that in, in uh, collaboration with citizens, actually the things that they would rather like, but for we can't do because it's complicated just yet, or perhaps um, it's expensive and so we need to look at other options, then you can navigate those tensions alongside your citizens. And actually what you find is your citizens will be part of that change. And they, the adoption of what you're trying to do uh, just just unlocks. So I think that there are collaborative um, mechanisms for communities to to um, to innovate, but also to progress. And the G20 plan I delivered and that I talked about at the BCI conference was around inclusion, and I delivered a growth agenda in order to, if you were to put inclusion inclusion. Um, to be your main theme, I could I could show how you get 4.4% growth across G20 member uh, nations. And nobody puts that on a table normally. And so there wasn't a great um, problem with actually having that as the plan. Um, so that's what they are. They're that collaboration uh, space, but we all move forward. But health and wellbeing outcomes are the key things we we, we check. You know, did we get to that? We're a success. You you made made an interesting point. You said a lot of these cities have multiple communities, so within them. So how do you go about uh, approaching it, uh, knowing that you know you could be talking to one community who has one set of requests. You go to another community; they've got something else. How do you deal with that? Because everybody could have a different priority. Well, um. I did um, a speech at Davos in 2019 where I was asked to speak about the future of the cybersecurity industry. It's quite a short talk because there isn't one. But I, what I did at that point was I, put, I brought the voices of the, the people that normally don't contribute. We have technology, deep tech technology, that allows us to connect with citizens who have the answers to the wicked questions. In my, in my counterterrorism world, the wicked question is the question you don't know the answer to and how do you find out? It, the question you've just asked is a wicked question. There is no answer. <laughs> so we have tech that goes out and asks that question. So for the G20, we actually um, went out across the G20 nations and spoke to 2 million people, uh, which is just a random selection of those people, self-selection, they decide, and ask them the answers to that question. And interestingly, what happens is you end up with a core set of needs and then a set of wants. And the needs are where you start framing your intervention. And if, you're, if you understand the technology, and that's really what our deep tech's about, it brings the citizen at the core of this. If you understand the technology, you can bring some wants alongside the needs. So for the G20 plan, the G20 nations, I did assessments for them all. And then they all have gone away, and I'm involved in lots of them, to actually say at a nation level, how do we do that? Because you have to, there's lots of grassroots stuff goes on with smart cities, individual communities, that's fantastic. But what we need to do in order to make the difference across an entire nation or a region or um, a series of nations, somewhere like Europe, where I'm, what's called a fire starter and I've crafted the expert I'm an expert advisor that's crafted that plan for Europe across 27 nations you have to be able to to connect with and understand that at that community level but then make sure it's it's something again not homogenous and takes that difference so essentially you find the need and then look at what wants you can also include it but it's a journey and and the civic responsibilities are more like a 
a sovereign wealth type path to funding as opposed to what's been going on, which is a tactical um, let's just fund to an elected agenda. And, and really, it's that tension. And of course, in a continuity sense and, and, and preparing for the unexpected a pandemic in this case, you actually have to stop doing the tactical and do the more strategic. Well, how, you just made an interesting point with the, you know, the community need and you've got the you know, elected officials and what they you know, see as, as the need. How do you bridge those? To know that, hey, you know, um, Mr. Mayor or Mr. Alderman or ele- elected representative, whatever the title is, you want A, B, and C, but your communities have agreed on X, Y, Z. You know, how do you Absolutely. bridge the two to say, like, hey, come on, you know, you're, you're not a smart city. You're separating your city. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I go get the data. I get the system to tell me. So at Davos, for example, 40,000 voices that are never heard in that particular debate you're talking about. And, and at the G20, 2 million voices that are never heard. Because it's uh, the, in the UK, for example, 10% of our population are digitally excluded. So most of the the interventions in smart cities are around digital technology. Well, automatically, you've got 10% of your population whose voice is not heard. So our tech connects with those people. uh, And there's there's issues around that. You can't do it just in tech. There's other things you need to do. And so, so my challenge always is to the civic elected sort of tension because everybody wants the same thing. They're just going about it in a different way is to actually let the citizens decide. So we bring the voice of the citizen in and we have a three-way debate. And then depending on what the answers are, um, like I say, the, the needs, I don't find the needs is the easy piece, but I like to, to set it for the future and bring some of those wants in. And so that's why somewhere like, um, like Glasgow in the UK is a health-led city and somewhere like uh, Tokyo is is looking at um, sort of managing cities within cities, the biggest city on earth, you know what I mean? So you actually, in context, then set it to that context. But I get the data. I actually ask the citizens, we do it one-to-one. Our tech, tech is um, privacy preserving, security-minded tech that, negoc- that, that talks to the citizens. If you're connected online, we can speak to you, we ask you. And it's very interesting. What you then get civic and elected leaders do is looking at the citizen voice. And, and this is not like focus groups. You can do it at scale. The biggest one we have is 34 million when we've done that study. Um, but you look at, to fit it to your population. So that can be just a city, it can be a region, it can be a nation. And we bring that to the table. And that's usually the differentiator between wants and needs, bringing those voices that are not heard in. And on that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. Today, we are talking about smart cities with Dr. Taylor. Sorry. (laughs) I can't believe I got the name wrong. With Dr. Jackie Taylor. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Moving forward can be difficult to do sometimes. There is always something going on. Many times, nobody else knows exactly what you're going through. If you are experiencing pain or loss, even something unexplained that is missing in your life, you'll want to tune into Go For It with host Joe Hausman. Joe and her guests will show you laughter and love. Sometimes you just need something a little positive in your week. Make that spot Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Are you finding your frequency? It can be described as that space between failure and success. It's the future of digital media. It's finding your voice. It's engaging topics, content, and ideas. Jeff and Ryan discuss the digital media space and all of its aspects. It's about making the mistakes, taking the chances, summoning the intestinal fortitude to step out of your comfort zone, and discovering what you can accomplish when you decide to try, decide to learn, decide that you have something to say, and find your frequency. Live Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, on the Voice America Variety Channel. What are the labels that identify us? 
Who are we and how do we figure out our place in the world? Do we own our narrative? If you were to create your biography today, what would it say about you? Listen for Dropping In with host Diane Dewey, the author of the award-winning memoir, Fixing the Fates. Diane and her guests will give their version of finding themselves. Find out about your authenticity by dropping in every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and 8 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Today, many doctors prescribe basic pharmaceuticals to their patients who aren't feeling well or have various aches or pains. Is this the right course of action for all patients? We don't think so. Find out about healthy, natural ways to help you feel your best by tuning in to the CBD Ed Show with host Ed Cheney. Ed and his guests will explain full-spectrum CBD using the whole hemp plant for good health and answer all of your questions about CBD and natural treatment in general. Listen Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, on Voice America Variety. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Preparing for the Unexpected with Alex Fuller. Email your questions to info at stone-road.com. Again, that's I-N-F-O at stone-road.com. Now back to Preparing for the Unexpected. And welcome back. Today we are talking about smart cities with Dr. Jackie Taylor. Apologies, uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's too early in the morning for me here, so I got your name. I <laughs> suddenly had a, a gap there in my mind. You know? <laughs> Thank That's goodness. okay. We're all human. Uh, yeah, I think no I, need, I must have more coffee in the morning or something <laughs> or stronger <laughs> tea. <laughs> um, great first segment. Lots of uh, good information. At the end, we were talking about how you bridge that gap between, you know, elected officials and what uh, the, the, the populace kind of wants. How do you go about talking with uh, the populace? You know, how do they get involved to even, one, know what a smart city is and know how to get involved to be able to express their needs and, and wants, as, as you put it? So it's a really good question. Um, the f- it's the first time when we use the tech that we use, uh, our tech has been built to navigate this journey. But you need a start point, and that's really what it does. For the first time, then officials see that an elected um, ambition and program and a civic ambition and program can be sort of correlated. They understand, that, and, and you can actually get them to look at that. Usually what happens then is I would help them um, pull together the overarching change that they're looking to do. And um, well, there's a series of interventions then for, um, for citizens to get involved. It's very interesting that um, we have a, um, a change that we did in Europe. I've done this exercise for Europe as part of the G20 plan. So the G20 plan, Europe goes to do its own plan. And what we decided was the citizen requirement was the key to deploy in this inclusion plan, the growth plan for Europe. And, and so what we did was we did the exercise I talked about. It's interesting that some of the key requirements that came out of that were ones that matched um, the European ambitions around, um, I mentioned it before, security minded and, and privacy preserving create a foundation that actually allows us to feel safe and included in our city. Um, and then as a result of that, we, we collected um, a series of other uh, needs, and then we were negotiating on those needs. And we did that in a variety of ways. We reached out online. We had uh, a series. We had almost a tour for 18 months where we engaged with citizens uh, online town halls, not really because it was a pandemic or anything like that, just because we needed to to look at the the main uh, stakeholder groups that we'd never talked to, because this evidence of the wiki questions was where the people were not involved in that conversation. So that became 
uh, where to start. And very interestingly, that has formed the basis for the intervention for the next seven years for um, the G20 plan for Europe. And that means that we will be delivering this change I'm talking about to 450 million people in 95,000 cities and not a single one of those interventions will be homogenous. So every city will actually take the core um, uh, collateral that we develop and then purpose it for their city. And so uh, that means that they'll be able to, at a local level, sense check that what we found, because of course these things are still only 34 million people, 2 million people, you know, it's not everybody sense check at a local level. But what it does mean is that the elected and at the civic level, there's a harmony. There is a, a, a real reason why you go out to the citizens as an offering. So this is our start point. And then effectively what I show them to do is what I did for Europe, repeat that process, but in the context of what you're doing. And the other thing that I, I love is we founded Flying Binary um, to uh, deliver the technology that Generation Z uh, need. Gen Z today are between the ages of 27 and um, uh, 17. And they now uh, influence 40% of the economic spend across the world. And that's one of the reasons the G20 took my plan, because if you're not purposing it for your future generation, then what are you doing? And so we all know what's happened, been happening since 2016 is the population's getting involved in this debate, not by invitation, but because they are and as a cohort, the millennials, you know, the, the cohort before Gen Z. And, and even for me, because the work we do since I spoke at Davos 2019 is Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha's view of smart cities is a completely different thing. Gen Alpha are 16 to 6, although my youngest entrepreneur is actually 4. Um, and their view of how this works is different. So what I also do is, aside from what I've talked about, I look at how we... We uh, meet the needs of, of the way this will work for Gen Z because they work differently and they expect to have different expectations. And then from a future proofing point of view, not all nations do this, but they are looking at what that might mean in the more of the civic responsibilities longer term. That, so that at the moment, everybody's focused on 2030, you know, beyond the Paris Accord to look at how we deliver beyond that. Um, but, but my work's focused at 2050, and at that point, you do have to bring Gen Alpha in. So there are some nations with the 180 that I, nations I work with that actually are looking at the Gen Alpha proposition and looking long term. But it just means that that tension between elected and civic leadership is resolved. And then is a, it's a combined um, roadmap for the, the future. And, and sometimes that's a 25-year one. Uh, not, gonna... not always. <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Let's say uh, I'm, uh, you know, well, I'm Alex. You know, I drive to work back and forth, and then suddenly I hear on the radio something smart city initiative. How do I uh, have it click in my head? I need to get involved with this because a smart city, you know, all I care is that the snow plows are out, you know, uh, exactly. here in Canada. You know, why yeah. do I need to get involved? You know, how do you get that message and what do you tell me that helps me want to get involved with smart cities and provide, you know, my priorities? You know, this is what I want in, in my city, you know, um, other, yeah. because I'm sure there are, you know, at, around the world, there are millions of people like me, you know, who just gets in the car, goes to work. You know, I don't care about this other stuff, you know, but why should I care? How do you get that message to me? So that's a slightly different problem. Once you've got this cohesion between the elected and the civic leadership, essentially the civic leadership are looking after the, the long term. The elected leadership are looking after what they're going to deliver in their term. At that point, we have a plan. We know what's in there. We know what needs we're going to meet. We know what wants we've been incorporated. And then it's about what does that mean for our services? So if, for example, um, just after hearing that on the radio, you're sat in your perennial queue, or you find your exit route is just blocked to get off where you need to get off and you know you've got an extra half an hour journey. If that's a problem, now I won't name the European country, but for example, what happened in that country when we did this exercise was the citizens literally, you know, heard we were doing this. We did it as an open thing with government in the country. 
And they literally traveled upwards of, a, of about 300 miles to say you're solving the wrong problem. They were inundated because when you make these plans, you announce them, you make them available on every literature, on every visit that any citizen might get. You'll just be blizzarded with the fact that there is this plan. And they, effectively, they, what cities do is they create a charter between themselves and the citizens. These are the top 10 things we're going to do, and this is why. And what these citizens in Europe said is all very well, but number one to number five just don't care. You just, we just don't care. You need to fix the trams in our cities because, and that actually was the problem. And once that was done, once the, 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 the government of that country said, okay, well, we're going to scrap everything we thought of. We're going to fix this, these trams. Actually, they got like a civic response at, you know, more people turning out to vote, uh, more people volunteering in communities, because there was, a, there was a contract, a new social contract between those citizens. And, you know, it works differently everywhere because smart cities are different everywhere. But actually, there are some core things that everyone can do to get that new social contract in place. And, and like I say, Generation Z, um, millennials, they're actively involved in this stuff anyway. It's not like the door's closed. The door's open. But you need to be able to make that frictionless for them because you don't want your journey to work interrupted. But if we can serve you with something where there's a, there's a collaboration with all the local radio stations to say, um, as you're tuned in, we're just going to interrupt you with this message because that means that you then – don't try and get off at that junction or you don't do this and you do the next thing. If that's what works for you in your city, that's what you do. And then the services are prioritized around that intervention. So it really is a, a way of remaking uh, public policy. Um, but the, the key thing, the growth agenda is the business element of this. These are our future business hubs. So where we look at, we've looked to a globalization agenda for the last few years because of online, Actually, the piece that's coming next is the hyperlocal and businesses forming growth hubs in where we are. Well, I was actually going to ask you next, you know, how do businesses get involved then? Because if we're looking at individuals and getting their or communities, you know, and, and the individuals in mm -hmm. those communities getting their feedback, you know, talking about, you know, my example, snow plowing, you know, it doesn't happen yes. when it should or, you know, uh, fixing the traffic or the trams. Uh, system uh, that you brought up how does business get involved what do they say what, what's their um, participation in this so that's my un work because that's actually a perennial problem that is that, you know enabling new marketplaces enabling business to create this new world for the industrial internet of things where we have all this technology that we need to leverage better technology is not the it's the enabler it's not the outcome but the outcomes are changed by what you do with it um, and so, so what happens with that is essentially um, the, the one key thing that's common about all the cities anywhere in the world is their procurement practices. And if you change them, you do actually unlock the, the way in which um, uh, cities procure services, products and everything else. And essentially within the UN team, we've been preparing a global uh, initiative we've been, we've launched the first part of that of how you can unlock that now any city can look at it but actually it's largely governments that are looking at it because governments have great spending power and if we spend it um, from a UN sustainable development goals around a net zero agenda we also have the the change we want from climate change and cities are great hubs for encouraging businesses that are hyper local so you're, you're um, using resources effectively, but actually bringing a green agenda at the, at to, directly to citizens. Citizens can do this piece, uh, government can do this piece, and businesses can do this piece. And that triangulation around procurement is, is a, a massive unlocker. We're talking about uh, over the next period, we're looking um, to, for the next 10 years, $131 trillion involved with that. We can spend that better. We can grow the new businesses we need and we can unlock the net zero agenda with it. And, and that to me is one of the fundamental changes, which is why I'm doing the work I'm doing in the United Nations, because I know that will be 
that will step change all of our cities across the entire world. Just curious, because you, you got me thinking, what happens when you're, you've got your plan, you know, you've got your feedback you, you, from communities, you've got business involved, um, your elected officials, you know, are following the plan, you know, from yeah. everybody's input, and then something like COVID comes along and just knocks you off your plan. <laughs> how do you how do you yeah. kind of deal with that or or do you just keep going you know uh you know how, how do you deal with it because you know things well the, the, the interesting thing that i brought to the bci conference because you'd think that you'd think it knocks you off your road but it didn't so i delivered that plan in february 2020 with a three-year time scale to mobilize and within three weeks we had the environment where we could do it because nothing was anchored anymore. And so actually we did what was needed on an as needed basis. Now we haven't got everything right. You know, there's no country in the world that has done well, let's say. We've all had our struggles, but what it did do was bring the spotlight to those areas that I called needs before. So it gave that needs agenda more focus. And, and, and one of the things that we, we, we need to navigate now is what we then do as we, I've called this the phase we're in, the isolation economy, what we then do as we unlock the isolation economy about resetting that agenda. Um, but essentially, uh, I had no idea I'd delivered a COVID plan. I had no idea. That's not why I did it. I did it from a point of view of how do we navigate this complex journey, smart cities being the most complicated one, and, and bring citizens to the heart of that agenda but it turns out when you have a spotlight across everything every country does in the world, it helps you choose to meet those needs differently. And we've learned things about our world and our needs and our priorities in COVID. I mean, it's been obviously one of the most dreadful experiences and, um, you know, just within our lifetime, is it's going to set our focus. And, and I feel that we owe it to the people who have, we've lost to make the most use of it and and it has allowed us all to understand why we're we're stronger in this new new push technology is unlikely now to drive that agenda but certainly will support it one billion additional people are working online with technology um since the pandemic and that is a huge opportunity wow that's a big number yeah, a billion. <laughs> On that note, we've come to the end of our second segment. We are talking about smart cities today with Dr. Jackie Taylor. We'll be right back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Moving forward can be difficult to do sometimes. There is always something going on. Many times, nobody else knows exactly what you're going through. If you are experiencing pain or loss, even something unexplained that is missing in your life, you'll want to tune into Go For It with host Joe Hausman. Joe and her guests will show you laughter and love. Sometimes you just need something a little positive in your week. Make that spot Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Are you finding your frequency? It can be described as that space between failure and success. It's the future of digital media. It's finding your voice. It's engaging topics, content, and ideas. Jeff and Ryan discuss the digital media space and all of its aspects. It's about making the mistakes, taking the chances, summoning the intestinal fortitude to step out of your comfort zone, and discovering what you can accomplish when you decide to try, decide to learn, decide that you have something to say, and find your frequency. Live Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. What are the labels that identify us? Who are we and how do we figure out our place in the world? Do we own our narrative? If you were to create your biography today, what would it say about you? Listen for Dropping In with host Diane Dewey, the author of the award-winning memoir, Fixing the Fates. Diane and her guests will give their version of finding themselves. Find out about your authenticity by dropping in every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and 8 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. 
Today, many doctors prescribe basic pharmaceuticals to their patients who aren't feeling well or have various aches or pains. Is this the right course of action for all patients? We don't think so. Find out about healthy, natural ways to help you feel your best by tuning in to the CBD Ed Show with host Ed Cheney. Ed and his guests will explain full-spectrum CBD using the whole hemp plant for good health and answer all of your questions about CBD and natural treatment in general. Listen Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Variety. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. listening to Preparing for the Unexpected with Alex Fullen. Email your questions to info at stone-road.com. Again, that's I-N-F-O at stone-road.com. Now back to Preparing for the Unexpected. And welcome back. Today we are talking with Dr. Jackie Taylor about smart cities. Uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, you've said a lot of uh, great information about smart cities. Um, I know before we started recording today, I had made a mention, you know, that there are some cities and uh, presentations that I've sat through where officials have been so gung-ho, they latch on to it and they just want to march forward. Um, but you mentioned there's challenges with that, you know, and that, uh, you know, there can be problems down the road. Can you touch on those? Yeah, sure. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the the issues of of the world we live in now and the fact that we've got to navigate this new approach to provision of services, how we all live together. And and essentially we need to design that way forward. Uh, It's great to see the enthusiasm, but it always has to be tempered back to what we talked about already, the user need, but also a full understanding of technology. Um, Because often that that gung-ho approach hasn't considered all of what I call the value chain of smart cities. Everybody's involved, the whole of the stakeholders. I've talked a lot about systems, but there's, there's a whole set of players involved here. And it's complex. And so choosing those priorities might actually unlock the, the enthusiasm, but that has to be tempered with um, around an understanding of there are limits to some of these things and what are they. And the one that I often uh, get asked about is artificial intelligence. Obviously, we as a company, we build deep tech AI as a core offering for us. And um, what I say to people is most cities, most nations are not prepared because to, to, to even deal with AI, never mind bring it into smart cities, because no cloud if you're not doing what you're doing on the cloud, you have not got AI and you cannot have it. So it's a way of illustrating that we jump from a digital thing and a digital conversation into a whole new world because it's cloud only. Cloud first, it won't cut it, cloud only. That's how this new world works of deep tech. And so given that that's the case, there are many um, problems with anybody that starts where they are and just leaps into that world. And that enthusiasm is usually backed by that, that outcome in the sense that people are like, let's just go, let's just do this. But I, and and there's, there's not one way of, of dealing with that. It's usually context sensitive um, because the, the standards I've written around smart cities internationally take full account of the different jurisdictions, our legislative agenda, our regulatory agenda, our digital economies, which are different. So I would always have that conversation in a national setting. Now, having it at the G20 was obviously uh, tricky, but I navigated that for the G20. Navigating it for the UN is a different conversation. But then as we take the G20 plan to a nation setting, as, as I'm working with them to understand what that means, that's much easier because it actually has to be backed by your your, you know, the context of legislation regulation, which is usually there to safeguard, is usually there to support, you know, particularly on our 
contingency and resilience type setting, it's usually there to be leveraged. Um, and uh, particular around security and privacy, there's been many changes across the world since 2018. And, and I became the world's first smart city czar because we understood this was an arena where this had to be navigated in a consensual uh, context. Now, I, I, as you were talking, I, I thought of something to ask you. With smart cities, is there an end point? You know, how, do, do you get to, uh, you know, you go through all these uh, meetings and, and gatherings and, and uh, things you implement and, you know, you validate and all these different steps you go through. Is there a point where you say we're a smart city and that's it? Or is this like resiliency where you have to be uh, in, in more of an ongoing, consistently learning type of mode? You know, is there an end point? So it's a really good, it's a really good um, uh, question because essentially there's a maturity curve that sits behind everything I've said. So every city can take the journey. Every city will be different. And therefore their direction of travel will be different too. But as you mature the smart city offering and you do get citizens involved, you, you understand in a better context, more effective context, what that civic elected leadership possibilities are, and then you start to unlock the business growth, that gives its own opportunities. So one of the things I've worked on uh, recently is around sustainable finance. Everything I do is underpinned by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and not just SDG 11, uh, which is the smart city one. It's actually about the, the underpinning context, so we layer the SDGs. But one of the things that is a barrier to all of this, um, and until you've got to maturity level, it is an issue, is around how you finance this going forward. And actually, the, the best models are not necessarily government funding. And so unlocking some of the things that are more wants than needs, then you have to look to, to that agenda. So as the maturity curve, uh, I mean, some of the cities have been on this journey with me, or some of the nations have been on this journey with me since 2014. And some of the, the nations that you read about um, are on that maturity curve. But many are at the very beginning but everyone can start. And that's really what the G20 and the UN plans I've been developing are. Everybody start the journey. Because at the end of the day, things like net zero agenda for climate change and to be able to be more effective about what we do, um, the technology change is happening. Whether we like it or not, that's a given. So let's actually use that as a lever and then enable better outcomes. And, and that will change the landscape of everywhere, every city, every nation. So, so I guess that with um, technology con uh, continually changing and uh, people uh, moving in and out of cities, which sometimes changes the dynamics of cities, that yeah. smart cities really, uh, it's going to be an ongoing thing, right? Because our priorities are yeah. going to change, right? They, they are. And I think that ultimately they're that our future business hubs. As we, as we move towards net zero, as I look to my UN 2050 plan, we hyperlocal becomes more important. We become more sustainable. The, uh, another country in Europe has, um, has become sustainable from a food point of view. Um, so they have full food security apart from sausages. So if anybody listening knows about that, they'll know who I'm talking about. But that's because that has been a deliberate choice. They've made this journey on the basis that they wanted to secure the food supply. Um, because of where they are in Europe and, and lots of other reasons. And that actually, this whole smart city agenda helps them do just that and make those choices. And now they're looking at what they'll do next, given the foundation they've created is a secure food supply, which in the, in the um, climate change, uh, with the climate change uh, issues we've got to solve, that's actually quite a big deal that you get to, you can feed your people. Well, you know, if you can't take care of your people, then... You know, yeah. you, you're not going to be able to take care of anything else. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about that, that country with the, uh, <laughs> the, the sausages. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but so what happens when, um, you know, things do change? You know, I, I just want to ask on that, you know, when you're the dynamic of a city does change, mm -hmm. you know, um, either it's growth you know, yeah. um, because it's, you know, urban centers are getting larger. So at some point, you know, they will have one set of priorities working on those priorities. People are happy that those priorities are being addressed, 
but because yeah. of the city growing, all of a sudden those priorities are being changed. You know, how, how do you go back and keep revisiting, you know, are we going on the right, right spot? Well, that's, that's a great question as well, but it's a complex answer. Essentially, this new social charter that gets developed is the foundation for that. This is where we're all going. We've all agreed that that's it. But because it's been moving from cities to communities, there's a navigation at, at that level to be done. So serving the needs of all the population. Um, and as that growth occurs, it occurs for many reasons. So, so um, it's actually a, the, the underlying piece of what do you do about what you've described turns out to be you measure different things. You see the trajectory by measuring different things. What we measure at the moment largely across the world is uh, how many buses have run, how many um, uh, um, uh, schools are open, how many pupils are in there. We measure stuff. We don't measure what we have achieved. We, have, we don't measure impact. So one of the big changes that's going on is to change that measuring to outcomes, to impact, so that we know um, as things evolve, you know, if we see the impact declining, we need to take an intervention and do a review. We always review every year anyway, and we always review at the beginning of an election cycle. So we have natural review points in, but between those things, we should measure different things. And it turns out that outcome measures, as opposed to KPIs and all the other things that we would yeah. tend to measure in our industry, we don't measure those things in smart cities because that doesn't tell us. And then we get a change that, that comes in from left field and we think, well, what was that about? If you measure outcomes, you can actually foresee that change and, and predict it and do some preparations around it. It's like we all do from a contingency and resilience point of view, that foresight element, but what is it? And, and given we've navigated this journey in a pandemic, I'm fairly confident we've got the basis of it. But it's like anything, 80% of it will be there. And then, you know, it's the fact that we've got the professional skills and the, and the holistic team that sits around the table, not just an elected leader, but forms a team for, on, for the benefit of the city, which is, you know, citizens participating. Then we're all pulling together in the same direction. And if we decide to change it, we neg negotiate a change to the social contract. And, and, you know, if you want to, we've got, a, we've got a city in the UK that's currently deciding to be something else. And so it's navigating that journey with a bunch of conversations, a bunch of interactions, and they'll publish a new social chart to say, well, we were that, but we decided to be this now. And that's because we've, um, the UK has moved um, out of the European Union. It has some other options. And there are some things that we want to do with the UK. And this particular city has said, and this is our opportunity. So it's often opportunity that, um, you know, what you're talking about unlocks an opportunity that we didn't, couldn't see because that maturity curve, you have to get, you have to move along it to see that. And then you get a new set of choices. But that's really the underpinning of the 4.4% growth plan at the G20. Uh, unlocking the first set of opportunities, take people through that whole piece. There are actually nine scenarios. There's actually eight, but there's the ninth one that are all the exceptions. So there's nine scenarios. You start with one and then you, you, you know, depending on your journey, you unlock, uh, you know, a combination of a, of a second one. So I'm trying to explain something really complicated um, in a short few words. I apologize to the audience if it sounds complicated. It is. But a lot of this has already been done, but it's not being applied yet. So this is all very new. February 2020. Well, on that note, we've actually come to the end of our show. <laughs> uh, do you have a final thought on smart cities so you'll take a quick minute uh, final thought yes yeah, so i think that the thing about it is it's all of our futures the whole smart city movement the whole smart city change technology will enable us to live better lives but we'll decide the citizens will decide what that looks like so it's an it's an addition to our democracy it's actually a way in which delivers our democracy at a very local level and that will then obviously gives us a, a new landscape for, for business and opportunity. Um, so it's a great change. Uh, it's complicated, but very much it's worth, it's what we all need to do because it's where it's going anyway. So let's negotiate it. And on that note, we've come to the end. Do Dr. Taylor, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time and knowledge. And uh, I enjoy the subject of uh, smart cities. As I said, I've come across it a few times now and uh, you know, I'm kind of uh, getting really interested in it. So 
Thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise. I greatly appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. And, and thank you to the audience for listening as well. And, and, and I'm sure if you want to reach out to me anywhere and you've got follow-up questions or you have as well, Alex, just get back to me. I'm, oh, I'm available on all the usual places. <laughs> oh, I will. I will. <laughs> That's and great. Thank you. To everybody watching and everybody listening, stay prepared, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Preparing for the Unexpected. Please tune in for another edition featuring your host, Alex Bullock, next Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time and 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Business Channel. We'll see you here next week.